and uh, can I just say a word of thanks for uh, the welcome that I've received this evening and for the invitation uh, to come along again to Kilkeel this evening and to bring a message in the gospel. It's uh, a joy to be here. I've been here before. Look forward to coming. And uh, it's just good to be of help again. Um, this evening, with the pastor being away in St. Faith tonight. So it's good to be here. Thank you for coming. And I must say, the kingdom of Morn is looking powerful well this evening. And uh, it's just been lovely to come, take a drive up this evening, and to meet with people like-minded. And as we've been singing already, I've already enjoyed the, the singing already this evening, and to sing the lovely pieces that we've been singing already. And certainly the gospel already has been well told in those pieces that we have been singing. I want to read this evening in 1 Timothy chapter 1. If you have your Bible with you, 1 Timothy chapter 1. I know maybe that it's not good and we shouldn't maybe assume that everybody in our hearing has a knowledge of the gospel, but I would suggest maybe this evening that most would be familiar with this verse. It's verse 15 of 1 Timothy and chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 reads like this. This is a faithful say. And were they of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The writer is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. We'll read the verse again. That's all I wish to read this evening. One verse. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And I pray the Lord will bless that reading this evening from his own precious truth. This mighty text this evening, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I want you to notice, I see in this verse this evening that Paul, I believe, would draw our attention to three things about this text. Paul does three things with this text, and I just want to highlight them this evening in presenting the gospel tonight. He says, first of all, or he gives, first of all, a preface, or if you like, a foreword, or, or an introduction, uh, uh, like a preliminary explanation before he says it. He sort of wants everybody to be clued in and to be listening. And so before he even quotes the verse, the, the text that he wants to quote, he says this, he says, this is a faithful saying. He just seems to want to draw everybody in. In the original manuscript, apparently the first word in the Greek would be faithful. Faithful is the saying. Wants everybody just to get clued in on that, what he's about to say. This is a true word. This is a trustworthy saying. This is something that's dependable. A saying so trustworthy and so true that many can personally testify concerning its truth. Faithful is a saying, or this is a faithful 
say. Paul on three occasions in 1 Timothy, he uses this little stra this strategy of, 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 of coaching what he wants to say by first of all saying it's a faithful saying. He uses it again in 2 Timothy and he uses it once in Titus to draw everybody's attention to what he's about to say. He says this is a faithful saying. Whenever you stop and think about it, where would you go today in order to be sure that you're going to hear truth? I mean, just making the news recently, there has been that, that decision recently of what happened at Hillsborough in that football stadium 27 years ago. And people were saying time and time again, you heard them saying, we contended or we campaigned all these years. What for? For truth. We hear it in our own land. People want the truth of what happened for all the events that took place over the years. And what has come to light is that in places where you would expect the truth, we didn't hear the truth. In the highest places of security, even in our government. We have to admit that we, we stand back aghast and in amazement because, well, to put it as kindly as possible, men have been economical with the truth. But whenever you turn to the Word of God, we can find here absolute truth. This is the truth on which we stand. Paul says this evening concerning this text, he says this is a true saying. This is a faithful saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save them. You see, this lovely text, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, this is really the heart of the gospel, isn't it? I mean, we quote John 3 and 16, and we say, as it's already been read this evening, there's the gospel in a nutshell. We used to sing in our day in Sunday school concerning John 3 and 16, 25 words in John 3, 16. No greater text ever been seen. 12 words about God, 12 words about me, and the central word is son, son in the center, verse 16, John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Twelve words about God. He gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That concerns us. Whosoever believeth. What a text it is. I, the gospel in a nutshell. In Luke's gospel, the truth concerning Luke's gospel is in verse 10 of chapter 19. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's the heart of the gospel. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. John 3, verse 17, if you like, we have the word saved. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Christ Jesus came, says Paul, into the world to save sinners. Surely this is the heart of the gospel message. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth a son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. God sent forth his son. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Did you notice in this text that Paul puts Christ before Jesus? He doesn't say Jesus Christ. He says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That reminds us of this is the one who was the anticipated one. This is the one who was the expected one, the prophesied one, the promised one. Christ, he's the Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. He steps in to historical time. He comes from heaven. 
John begins his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, without him was not anything made that was made. And then he goes on to say, and the Word was made flesh. John uses five words just to describe the Savior's coming into the world. He's reminding us that he's the Son who was in the beginning with the Father. He, John in his gospel presents him as the only begotten Son, the one who was in the beginning with God. Over 2,000 words in Luke's gospel describing his birth. Uh, but John presents him as the Son of God. John just simply says the Word was made flesh, dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist testified of him. John, it says, bear witness of him. This is he of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me, says John the Baptist. John's just the forerunner. And John stood one day in the banks of Jordan and declared, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The gospel message this evening in nine words tonight in our text is this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Tell me this evening, have you ever stopped for a moment and wondered, where would we be, what would we be, if it wasn't for the truth of the gospel? Think about it. Think about our text tonight. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What if he hadn't come? I'm reminded of Paul this evening. I stopped the other night and I thought to myself, you know, Paul uses an argument similar to this. Paul, when he's speaking to those that didn't believe in the resurrection, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if there's no resurrection, if there's no resurrection of the dead, well, then Christ is not risen. And then he says, and if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching in vain and our faith in vain. Then he goes on to say, and if Christ be not raised, your faith in vain, yours, and we're still in our sins. If Christ is not risen, Paul says there's no hope for those that have fallen asleep. If the Lord's not risen. Then he goes on to say, but in Adam all die, ah, but in Christ are all made alive. What if the Savior never came? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you know what we're left with in that text if he never came? We're left with one word. Sinners. That's where we would be this evening. Without the message of the gospel. Without the truth of the gospel. Without one who came from heaven's glory. Sinners. Lost, born in sin, shaven in iniquity, on a broad road, taking us to a lost eternity, sinners. No wonder Paul, he wants everybody to tune in. No wonder Paul uses this little preface and he says, this is a faithful saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I was reading Romans 5 the other evening. And those first 12 verses of Romans 5. And I read verse 6 which says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died to the ungodly. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And I thought to myself, as I had been thinking of this verse, what if the Savior hadn't have came? And I looked at the verse again, and I think all it would say is this, without strength and ungodly. The rest of it wouldn't be there. Ever think of that? 
The old hymn says, how helpless, how hopeless we sinners had been if he never had loved us to cleanse from our sin. How helpless, how hopeless if the message of the gospel wasn't true. And if Christ never came, we're without strength, ungodly. I read on in, in Romans 5, and I came to there, the 8th verse, and the 8th verse says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a truth. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If he hadn't have came, there would have been no Calvary. There would have been no way back to God from the dark paths of sin. Do you know what we would have of Romans 5 and 8 if Christ hadn't came? Well, I could only see two words that would be left. We're yet sinners. Yet sinners. Without strength, ungodly, verse 6. Yet sinners, verse 8. And I read on in Romans 5. And I came to verse 10. And verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And I looked at that verse. And again, I thought to myself, what, what if there was no gospel? What if Christ hadn't come? Where would we be without the message and the glad tidings of God's so great salvation? Romans 5 and 10, I had to conclude, would consist of one word. The word would be enemies. Or if when we were enemies, past tense, when Paul writes in Romans 5 and 10, what if we're still enemies without salvation? Our backs toward God, descendants of Adam, men like Cain, Esau, no time for God. Enemies. I without strength ungodly, yet sinners, enemies. And I read on in Romans 5, and I came to verse 12, and I read verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And I read the verse again. And I looked at it again. And I thought to myself, if Christ hadn't have came, Romans 5 and 12, every word of it would still be as it is. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned. That's true this evening. If you're in our meeting tonight and not saved, that's true of you tonight. Sin entered into the world. Death by sin. Death has passed upon all. We're all sinners in the sight of God. And if you're not saved, that's who you still are. Sinner in the sight of God. I dying one day. I'm going to die without hope. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered. We all descended from Adam. Sinners by birth. Sinners by practice. Sinners by nature. Sinners by choice. Sin entered into the world. And death came with it. Whenever I stand, I often think when I stand in, around an open grave at, at the most recent funeral I'm, I'm at, I often think to myself, not a bit of wonder God hates sin. Not a bit of wonder God will judge sin. Sin entered. 
I am death because of sin. Death has passed upon all men. For all have sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's where you are tonight. If you're not saved. What a message. How helpless, how hopeless. If it hadn't been for the one who left heaven's glory and came down to the sin cursed scene of time and went his way to Calvary and there laid down his life a ransom for all and bearing your sin and my sin in his own body upon the tree. And Paul's about to make a lovely, mighty statement. And before he even utters a word of it, he wants to make sure all here, he, it's like, it's like a, they talk about a town crier in a bygone day, going out and shouting, hear ye, hear ye, to draw everybody's attention. Paul says, that's a faithful saying. Or it's like a master of ceremonies who sort of takes a spoon and wraps the table to get everybody's attention. Paul says, this is a faithful saying. Tell it. Shout it. Declare it. Preach it. Broadcast it. Everybody needs to hear it. Publicize it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, if only I could create the anxious thought. I was thinking recently about an anxious thought. It's a phrase that I hear in every prayer meeting, I imagine, that I attend before the gospel. People saying, Lord, we can't create an anxious thought. And I would agree with that. But yet we stand up here in Lord's Day evenings and we try to create the anxious thought, don't we? Oh, that God would take the Word of God and the Spirit of God would take the Word of God and apply it to the heart of some tonight and create that anxious thought regarding your soul and cause you to see that I'm a sinner in the sight of a holy God. Ah, but Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, if only some would, could learn that again for the very first time maybe, and grasp it. Paul says it's a faithful say. He wants to draw everybody's attention to it. He needs to publicize it. What a truth it is. But I don't think he just prefaces this saying, this text, by, by calling it a faithful saying. He adds something else to it. He says it's worthy of all acceptation. This is a faithful saying, publish it. Worthy of all acceptation. I think he says prioritize it. Oh, I need to prioritize it. He says it's worthy of all acceptation. It's something of great value. And you get a grasp of the truth of it. Worthy of all ex- something so weighty that nothing else it weighs it. Something that you can put all your trust and faith and dependence upon it. It's worthy of all acceptation. You not see it this evening in the meeting. You're not saved because there's never been a time in your life when you've prioritized this truth. You maybe know it. I've already said at the outset of the meeting, I make an assumption. I'm not really maybe quoting any text tonight that people aren't already familiar with. You might be here tonight, and you're so familiar with this gospel message. I have brothers tonight. They're so familiar with this gospel message, they could preach it as well as I could preach it. They're not saved tonight. They never give it sufficient priority. Never prioritize it. There's always been something, something else is more important. Tell me tonight. 
Stop. Will you stop for a moment and think? Is there anything more important than your soul's salvation? need to be careful how you treat this text. You need to be careful with it. Paul says it's worthy of all acceptation. Up until now, oh, you haven't made any, you haven't made any formal rejection of it. No, no. Up until now, you've just neglected it. Just never had time. Like one of old, when I have a convenient season, hope to be saved one day. Never prioritize it. Paul says we need to prioritize it. Paul says it's a faithful saying. And it's worthy of all acceptation. It's a message of great value. Why? Because it has to do with the salvation of something of great value. And that's your soul. What shall it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world, lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And yet tonight, there's a multitude out there And there's so much more has been given and continues to be given in exchange for the soul's salvation. Paul says this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. I was looking for a hymn. I couldn't find it in the hymn book. It's a lovely hymn we sing sometimes, Oh, teach me what it meaneth, that cross uplifted high. One, the man of sorrows condemned to bleed and die. Oh, teach me what it cost thee to make a sinner whole. Oh, teach me, Savior, teach me the value of a soul. Paul says we need to, we need to prioritize it and learn the value of it. It's worthy of all acceptation. Tell you you need it. You'll never get to heaven without it. The faithful saying was worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Tonight you're saying he needn't have bothered. You've rejected him up to now. I tell you, I tell you, you need to go out of time and into eternity with a saved soul. You're ready to meet God. Sin's forgiven. Sure of it. Can you sing tonight, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more, and it's well, it's well with my soul. Can you sing that this evening? Because there's a time in your life when you prioritize the truth of the gospel. And you said to yourself, I need it. Worthy of all acceptation. The Apostle Paul in this little verse tonight, he just doesn't give it a preface. He just doesn't say this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. And then he quotes the text. I think he also gives it an addendum. He puts a little footnote to it. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Of whom I am chief. Paul says, I believe, Paul says concerning this text, he says, oh, it's a faithful sin. We need to tell it. We need to make sure all, all hear it. We need to declare it. We need to publicize it. It's worthy of all acceptation, he says, we need to prioritize it. Paul quotes the text. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
and then he personalizes it. We need to personalize it. I love the way Paul personalizes it. He thinks of it again. Oh, he came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world to save me. Paul says, of whom I am chief. He saved the chief of sinners when he saved me, says Paul. He personalized it. That's what you need to do. If you're ever going to find God's salvation, you have to personalize it. Aye. Good enough for your mother, good enough for your father. Now you need to personalize it. I worked with a man. I worked with a man and he said to me one day, my son's like you. And he's all pleased. Son was saved. Going to meetings. He said, my son's just like you. And he's all pleased about it. The man himself not saved. I said, what about you? No good having others in the family saved and ready for heaven. And a knowledge of sins forgiven. And knowing that all is well to the soul. You need to personalize it. For yourself. Paul says, of whom I am chief. That hymn I quoted earlier, there's a lovely verse in it. I think it's the last verse. So teach me what it meaneth. For I am full of sin. And grace alone can reach me. And love alone can win. Oh, teach me, for I need thee. I have no help beside. Chief of all the sinners, for whom the Savior died. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. The old man got to the cross, and the old man finished there at the cross. I'm crucified with Christ. He says, nevertheless, I live. Christ liveth in me. He says, I got new life at the cross. He says, the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God who, who loved me. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ah, oh, that's it. You need to personalize it. You need to get to the place where you recognize your need of a Savior. You need to get by faith to the foot of the cross. You need to see the one who, who hung and bled and died on the cross. You need to get to the place where you're and, and, and recognize that the one who died on the center tree died for me. Took my sins and my sorrows, made them his very own, for the burden to Calvary. Suffered and died alone, died for me. We often sing on our Lord's Day morning, all my sin were laid upon him. Jesus bore them on the tree. God who knew them led them on him. And believing, I go free. If you're not saved this evening, you need a personalized. You need to get to the place where you realize, Son of God loved me, gave himself for me. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. Believe that he died for me. That's it. I'm only a guilty, hell-deserving sinner. Without strength, ungodly. Still in my sins. Enemy. Back toward God. Ah. But there's one who died for me. Paul says, publicize it. Paul says, Paul says, prioritize it. It's worthy. Paul accepts it. Paul says, personalize it. This is a faithful saying. And it's worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. 
If you're here this evening, not saved, I trust you'll be wise tonight. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him for salvation while he is yet near. Shall we pray?